Welcome to the Fundamentals Lecture for Chem 118, Experiment 6, Steam Distillation. During this lecture, we'll discuss some naturally occurring organic compounds and how and why we choose to source them this way instead of make them in the laboratory. Then we'll talk a little bit about the phase behavior of immiscible liquids and contrast that to our discussion of distillation, which we had early in the fall semester. And then finally, we'll take a look at a steam distillation apparatus and try to understand how it is that we can separate these compounds from the host plant material using this technique. And that's really our inquiry for the week. How do we isolate extremely low volatility organic oils from the larger molecules which make up the insoluble portions of plant material? We haven't yet used a technique which will allow us to do this, but there is one that exists, and that is steam distillation. Let's begin our discussion by taking a look at a few of the great synthetic organic chemists of the last 200 years, including everyone's favorite, the father of modern organic chemistry, Friedrich Wöhler, who kicked everything off in 1828 when he accidentally synthesized the organic compound urea from the inorganic material ammonium cyanate. A century later, 1945, Robert Burns Woodward and his contemporaries were able to create penicillin and many other antibiotics derived from it in the organic chemistry laboratory. And as great and influential as these experiments and inventions became, there are other chemists who've been at work for much, much longer. Here are just a few of them, some of the great synthetic organic chemists of the last 200 million years. You see, small organic compounds don't have to be created in a laboratory. We can source them from natural products. For example, the willow tree creates salicylic acid. The plant cannabis can be used to source tetrahydrocannabinol. And Pacific U is the source of taxol. These three represent an analgesic, a psychotropic, and an anti-cancer drug, respectively. All very useful and powerful organic molecules, none of which are synthesized in a lab on a regular basis. But this ability to create useful organic molecules isn't limited to plants. Consider higher order animals, like pigs, whose pancreas, until just a few decades ago, was the source of insulin used to treat human diabetics. Or Streptomyces, the source of one of the most powerful antibiotics ever discovered, Streptomycin. So with so many powerful organic chemists at work, aside from human beings, how is it that we can possibly compete in a laboratory? After all, these biological systems have been finely honed over hundreds of millions, if not a few billion years, to be so good at what they do. Well, the answer is often that we don't bother to compete. We just steal their stuff. And we do it using an array of techniques, including steam distillation, pressure extraction, and also solvent extractions, and many, many others. So this week we'll be using just one of these techniques, steam distillation, to acquire one of these useful small organic molecules from a very familiar plant source. But before we start talking about exactly how we'll be doing steam distillation, let's think a little bit about how steam distillation works and why it's necessary to isolate these essential oils from plant material. And to do this, we're going to have to go back and review our discussion of Raoult's, Dalton's, and Ideal Gas Laws from our distillation lecture back in the fall. Now remember that if we make a plot of vapor pressure versus composition for a mixture of miscible liquids, that we can plot Raoult's law for each of the liquids, which will have a zero intercept on one side, and of course on the other side, an intercept which is uh, corresponds to their vapor pressure when pure. And I can do this for both of the two compounds in my mixture. In this case, just general A and B. Now Dalton's law allows me to combine these two different vapor pressures at any given composition. 
thereby determining the vapor pressure of the total mixture. And back in the fall, we noted that when we do this, we generate a system in which the vapor pressure can never exceed the vapor pressure of the more volatile component and can never be less than the vapor pressure of the less volatile component, leading to a situation in which we can distill various mixtures of the two. But the question here becomes, what if we're not dealing with miscible liquids? What if instead we're dealing with an immiscible mixture, something that doesn't dissolve into, say, water, for example? Well, the answer to this question is that we have to throw the old rules out. Most specifically, we have to throw Raoult's Law out because it is predicated on the idea that the mixtures are intimately mixed at the molecular level. And in the case of oils and water, this is rarely the case. This drastically changes the nature of our plot. Because Raoult's Law doesn't apply, each of the liquids in an immiscible mixture will establish its own vapor pressure independently of its concentration. This means those sloped lines that corresponded to Raoult's law in our previous diagram are no longer sloping, now they're straight. It doesn't matter how much A and B I have in the mixture, the vapor pressure of A will always be the same, and the vapor pressure of B similarly will be unchanging as the composition of the mixture changes. Applying Dalton's law, again, lets me know that I'm going to have a system in which very little changes as one of the two liquids changes in concentration. So it would appear at a glance that we have a problem here. We can't really distill mixtures of immiscible liquids as a means of separating them. But in the case of steam distillation, we're going to use that to our advantage and deliberately distill a mixture of water and oil to get it away from the insoluble plant material. After which we can then purify our oil itself with a simple extraction into an organic solvent. <clears throat> now that we've discussed a little bit about the theoretical nature of trying to distill immiscible mixtures, let's take a look at a more realistic example. Let's take the example of eucalyptus, which is a source of a compound known as 1,8-cineol, also sometimes called eucalyptol. Eucalyptol, as you can tell from its structure, is a very low polarity compound and is essentially immiscible in water. In fact, eucalyptol's solubility in water is about 0 0.0225 milligrams per milliliter. Even this very, very marginal solubility can generally be neglected, as is evidenced by many of the solvents we use in the organic chemistry lab. We often think of ether, dichloromethane, and chloroform as being completely immiscible with water when the truth is that they do have a very small solubility. But it's so small that it's essentially negligible. And we're going to treat our eucalyptol in the same way. So let's do a little bit of math here and see if we can prove to ourselves that we can isolate eucalyptol using a steam distillation. In other words, we can deliberately distill away a mixture of water and cineol or eucalyptol from the insoluble plant material that we want to isolate it from. Now the vapor pressure of 1,8 cineol is about 60 torr near the boiling point of this mixture and water is about 700 torr. So let's use those numbers and try to calculate exactly how much of each we would expect to be moving out of a flask containing the two at boiling as a vapor. The mole fraction of the oil is simply the number of moles of oil divided by the total number of moles of gas which is escaping our boiling flask. And we know that that's equal to the partial pressure of the oil over the total pressure of the system. We can derive this using the combined gas law. And we already have the numbers which we expect based upon our problem, 60 torr for the oil and a total of 760 torr for the entire system. This leads to a calculation of a mole fraction of about 0.079 for our organic oil. 
So only about 8 mole percent of the vapor moving out of a boiling mixture of oil and water would be expected to be oil. And this doesn't sound so great, but let's keep going and see what happens. Naturally, if it takes gallons of water to obtain a gram of this oil, this may not be the best technique. But what if it only took a small amount? Well, I want to be sure that I do my homework before going into the lab and spending a lot of time and energy on a steam distillation. So let's take that mole fraction that we determined previously and turn it into more usable numbers, mass. One gram of oil needs to be distilled using how much steam in order to isolate it from the plant material. Well, I know that there is a molar mass of 154.25 grams per mole for that particular compound. I also know from my previous calculation that the mole fraction in the vapor phase is going to be 0 0.079 moles of oil per mole of total gas moving through my still. Next, I add a factor to calculate for the mass of water, and my unit analysis tells me that this calculation will tell me exactly how much water is required to remove that one gram of oil. And in this case, it's only about 1.36 grams. So this is actually a very feasible way to get cineol or eucalyptol from the eucalyptus plant. Now note that the eugenol that we're going to attempt to steam distill in our lab this week only has a vapor pressure of about 3.3 millimeters mercury or 3.3 torr. So you should calculate for yourself exactly how much water will it take to remove an entire gram of eugenol, which is approximately the amount that we like to obtain. <clears throat> the apparatus that we use to obtain this material is what's known as a steam still or a steam distillation apparatus. The apparatus that we use to conduct a steam distillation is very similar to that used for a simple distillation, but with one very important change. There's a boiling flask as usual, but that boiling flask is split by a Claisen adapter. And one of the two ports generated by the addition of the Claisen adapter is attached to a reservoir, in our case a separatory funnel, which will act as a source of water. Remember that with immiscible liquids, we can add as much of one as we like to the other, and the other will continue to maintain its same vapor pressure, regardless of how much we have diluted it with the other liquid. We're counting on this this week. From the other side of the Clayson adapter onward, we have a simple still, including a still head, a thermometer to help monitor the temperature, a west condenser with cold water plumbed in the bottom out the top, a vacuum adapter, and of course a receiving flask to collect our oil and water mixture. In addition to this, keep in mind that there will be three clamp points and two clip points to help keep our apparatus together and stable inside of the fume hood. <clears throat> Shown here is a slightly different build than the one that I just showed you, which we'll be creating in our labs, but it helps to show exactly what goes on during a steam distillation. In this steam still, I have three different types of compounds. I have water, an immiscible oil, shown in red, and non-volatile plant material indicated by the larger brown spheres. As I begin to run a steam distillation, what I'm going to do is open the separatory funnel valve thereby allowing the water to continually flow into the boiling flask. As I heat that boiling flask, the mixture of water and immiscible oil will begin to vaporize. But remember, they're immiscible, which means that their vapor pressures will be unchanging. So as long as there is any small amount of immiscible oil remaining in the boiling flask, some of it will move through the steam still. The benefit of this is that not only will I eventually be able to remove all of the immiscible oil, but that I'll be able to do so at approximately 100 degrees centigrade. And this temperature control helps to prevent this molecule from breaking down. 
as organic oils tend to have very high boiling points and sometimes will even thermally degrade before they reach their boiling points. By the end of the process, I should have a situation in which I have moved all the immiscible oil into the receiving flask and in, the, in doing so separated it from the non-volatile material but thereby mixing it with water. So I've done one separation and I've created a new one for myself. But the distinction here is that the new separation is much easier to accomplish. I can simply use an extraction with organic solvent to recover the oil from the oil-water mixture. When conducting your lab this week, keep in mind that you should never heat a closed system. Uh, the flow director, or vacuum adapter, has a hose barb on it which can be left open. And as long as this is done so, the system is safe to heat. Also remember that if you're performing a distillation on cloves, the whole cloves need only be cracked open to expose a fresh surface using a mortar and pestle. Grinding them to a fine powder is unnecessary. And also keep in mind that GCMS is a very sensitive technique which requires only a few parts per million concentration in your sample. So a drop of essential oil in a GCMS vial is more than you'll need to complete this analysis. <clears throat> this week any liquids containing dichloromethane should naturally be deposited to a halogenated organic waste container. The isolated product from your steam distillation can be dissolved in acetone since it's likely to be a very small quantity of a very thick liquid. And that solution in acetone can then be rinsed into the non-halogenated organic waste container. Standard rules will apply for solids, broken glass, filter paper, and the like. To summarize your procedure for the week. We'll steam distill 4 grams of an assigned plant material, most likely cloves, to remove any immiscible oils that are present in that plant material. The steam distillate will naturally include quite a bit of water. So we'll want to collect the organic oils using an extraction with dichloromethane. After rotary evaporating the dichloromethane, we'll weigh the recovered oils to determine the percent recovery. This will give us a good estimate of what fraction of the original mass of plant material was actually organic oil. Finally, we'll analyze that recovered product by GCMS to determine the number and identity of components in the essential oil from those plant materials. And finally, we'll clean the lab up and we'll be done for the week. In summary, the goals for this week's lab are twofold. One, to isolate essential oils from cloves or a similar plant material using a steam distillation. And two, to determine the composition of that oil using a GCMS analysis. We'll see you on Monday for your recitation where we'll discuss more about how we're going to accomplish this in the lab. This week I'll be making available to some of you a new tool called the Virtual Build. I've created this virtual build as part of the Initiative for Technology Enhanced Learning here at Georgetown University. So I'll be allowing a portion of the students to use this and then evaluate how that has helped you to prepare for the course or at least for this experiment. This application runs in HTML5 and so should be able to run on any device capable of viewing HTML5 such as smartphones, tablets, and laptop computers. If you have any trouble viewing or using this application, please contact me and let me know so that we can troubleshoot the, any issues that you've come across. It'll be accessible through the Blackboard course website in a section which will be called Virtual Build. And I'll only be giving access to even numbered section students prior to running our steam distillation experiment. When we're in lab this week, your TAs will be doing an evaluation and offering a survey to you regarding the build. So we're going to be looking for specific, uh, specific quality points in what you've created inside your fume hood and also getting some opinion from you about how this application may have helped you prepare. 
Now, I don't want you to worry if you don't have access to this virtual build. Your build will not be graded this week, although it will be evaluated by your TA for research purposes. Your build will not be graded. And once we've completed the lab exercise and collected all of our survey data, I'll give course-wide access to this so that everyone can play with it and let me know how you like it, whether or not you think it's useful, and if you find any technical issues, we can correct those hopefully before the next round. So I'd like to thank everybody in advance uh, for playing with my new toy here, my virtual build, and uh, for giving me as much feedback as you possibly can as we try to make this a useful tool for the course.